Okay, uh, so today we're very happy to have Julian Sonner from Geneva telling us about causal symmetry breaking and holographic chaos. Please go ahead, Julian. Okay, well, thank you very much, Nima, and thanks to everybody for inviting me. Um, uh, well, as it was discussed, uh, this is about causal symmetry breaking, and this name is probably unfamiliar. Um, and uh, I will try to describe exactly what I mean by causal symmetry and then obviously also by its breaking. Um, and that will be a good part of this seminar. And then hopefully um, I will also be able to explain more why and how it plays a role in holography and in particular how it gives sort of um, what I believe to be a nice application of quantum chaos to holographic duality. So, oops. Uh, yeah. So uh, the most most of this work actually is this last uh, preprint that I'm highlighting here, which was written with Alexander Altland at the University of Cologne. But uh, actually, uh, a lot of this also came from ongoing work and work to be published soon with Alex and also with Manuel Vielma, who is a PhD student here, and Pranjal Nayak, who is a postdoc here. So. Um, I have roughly three parts. Um, the first part will just be a general uh, introduction to give uh, the context that, that I think this operates in or that I would like to frame uh, this causal symmetry breaking in and a motivation to look at quantum chaos and holography. And then, um, well, because there is symmetry breaking, there's going to be basically light degrees of freedom and an effective field theory that is governed by those light degrees of freedom. I will describe that um, in a somewhat technical way. And then um, I would um, already like to transition here to basically what this might mean in the bulk. Um, and uh, the clearest application that we've been able to locate so far is in minimal string theory, but maybe I'll also make some comments on, on three-dimensional um, gravity. All right. So um, the big picture, why is there um, any sort of anything interesting to say in the um, connection between quantum chaos and holography. Well, as no doubt almost all of you have heard many, many times, this uh, ADS-CFT duality, so duality between anti de Sitter space gravity and conformal field theories, um, precisely relates uh, ADS gravity to unitary field theories, which are very often CFTs. And so in principle, it offers a way to basically ask the vexing questions that we like to ask in gravity and to formulate them in a field theory, a CFT, that in some sense we have much more of a solid handle of. And maybe even one might say um, sort of a good intuition what should happen. And so that's precisely the goal is to use the quantum dynamics um, of a field theory uh, to shed light on some of the paradoxical behavior of black holes. And in particular, uh, the behavior today that I will focus on is uh, the quantum very late time behavior of black holes. And so one, well, one I think very nice connection that in some sense got me thinking about this in the first place is this by now a few years old, a paper with um, Tarek Anus, with Tom Hartman and Antonin Rolai, in which we showed very explicitly how um, essentially one can um, form a black hole by essentially looking at a quenched experiment. So the idea was that, uh, you know, a black hole corresponds to, well, the interesting case, let's say, of a black hole that forms corresponds in some sense to a very sudden energy injection um, in a region where it compresses, forms a horizon and eventually a singularity, as I'm illustrating here. And of course, we're looking at ADS. So we're looking at a boundary configuration which gives rise to such a pulse. And um, well, what that means is that uh, we found uh, essentially an initial state, a highly excited initial state in this quantum field theory. In this case, we did it in a two-dimensional uh, non-rational CFT. And we were able to follow its uh, evolution in the sense of quantum thermalization until um, late times. But of course, um, what that means is that, uh, in some sense, the process of late time physics of evaporation of this black hole um, and uh, essentially the understanding <coughs> of the late time quantum physics is the same as the understanding of what happens in this field theory as a result of this quantum quench. But of course, you know, I'm also translating it into bulk observables, but essentially um, it's uh, a question of what happens 
uh, to thermalizing quantum field theory, strongly coupled quantum field theories that have uh, this desirable feature of having a holographic dual. And so, um, well, we have been trying to push this uh, further and further. In particular, we've been um, pursuing this at sort of all relevant timescales. And the timescales that I would like to talk about in this talk are really very late timescales, which I will define more carefully. But basically, timescales at which the system is well described by um, a system that has become um, chaotic and that is described by basically uh, the uh, typical quantum chaotic physics that comes from assuming that the system has an ergodic limit. Okay, so um, furthermore, I want to give a, a bit of a bigger picture um, that also makes a connection to recent discussions of ensembles. So how, how, how does this actually uh, make any sort of connection with the idea of ensembles and random matrix theory? So RMT here stands for random matrix theory. And one way of motivating this is um, what I'm citing here as the Buhigas Giannoni Schmidt conjecture, or what I'm paraphrasing here. And uh, the Buhigas Giannoni Schmidt conjecture actually says the following thing it says that if you have a classically chaotic system, so for example, uh, general relativity, or uh, you know, other more, more uh, sit down to earth examples like uh, chaotic billiards and so on, then Roughly speaking, they behave quantum mechanic mechanically like the predictions that you would get from a random matrix ensemble. So I put this little asterisk here. This is just um, to be perfectly clear that there is a big exception to this, which will not play a role in this talk, but it's basically systems that are, you know, that are chaotic classically, but that localize quantum mechanically. So they, they don't actually behave um, like a, a random matrix system, but those are not the kind of systems that I'm interested here. So with that caveat, one can say again, this conjecture is that a classically chaotic system, so a system that uh, you know, has chaotic dynamics in the sense of Lyapunov, for example, quantum mechanically behaves like an ensemble. So in particular, um, in the way that if I look at the distribution of level spacings of such a system. So this is some data that is presented in this paper by Buhigas and friends. Uh, and I look at such a system, then the quantum mechanical level spacing distribution follows that of one of the classical random matrix ensembles, where I'm basically drawing a Hamiltonian randomly from a particular probability distribution. Um, so, for example, here, uh, what is shown is the prediction of the general, the, the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And one can actually see that this has a prediction of this sort of uh, well, bell-shaped curve. And what one has also shown here is that one takes uh, a, a chaotic system um, and the level spacing distribution experimentally. Here, this is from large nuclei, and one finds that there is actually a pretty good uh, sort of uh, agreement, I would say. The other thing that is shown here is that it is basically distinguishing um, what is happens in this chaotic case from a case which is not chaotic, namely integrable. And this is when these level spacing distributions are basically Poisson. But the point is uh, more that indeed this prediction of an ensemble of theories seems to fit a particular theory, namely that here of a large nucleus. And there are of course other examples, but this is the one which Prohigas and friends cited. Now, let's actually go immediately to um, the context that interests me the most, which is that uh, in recent years, um, as you all are aware, there has definitely been a certain renaissance of uh, the idea that two-dimensional black holes can be described by random matrix ensembles or by matrix models, as is more the language in our field. And um, the statement here is that two-dimensional black holes are exactly described by random matrix ensembles. So the, more recently, the names associated with that are, of course, Kitaev and then the Stanford group, and also Juan and friends. And so um, the way that this manifests itself, it's, it's actually a very similar, this is a very, very similar uh, physical manifestation as the one here. It just looks different in the way that it's presented. But one looks at the spectral form factor, which is basically the, the, the Fourier transform in time of the level spacing distribution. And one points out that it has this characteristic shape, which basically uh, the, the part that I want to focus on is this what people call the ramp, this rise here, and then the plateau. 
And what turns out to be the case is that this is precisely if you take the level spacing distribution of one of these ensembles and you Fourier transform it, then um, they behave like this. They have this ramp and they have this plateau. Now, um, what I want to point out here is already something which will be an important lesson from the talk is that there is different ways of looking at this. There is this way, which is, you know, um, basically in two dimensions that there are simply gravitational theories which are exactly described by random matrix ensembles. So there's no surprise that the whole thing just looks like a random matrix. But what I want to point out is that there is a meaning also to this random matrix universality for a theory which is not itself exactly described by a random matrix, but which is, it, which is just a chaotic quantum system. And this connection, how you can basically uh, associate these random matrix predictions to individual chaotic systems in a sense to be made precise, is one that I want to explain in this talk. And this is one that I want to use basically to speculate a little bit whether this association of bulk physics to random matrix physics is a weird feature that we can only find and expect in lower dimensions, or whether it could be an important more general lessons, a lesson that might even um, teach us something about higher dimensional gravity. And I think you see already the drift is of course that if we don't demand that our system is exactly described by a, a random matrix theory, then um, essentially uh, we can focus on only this universal quantum chaotic regime and say that approximately this theory will be described by a random matrix theory just like it was the case with the nuclei. Sorry I, I actually hesitated a bit because something came up on my screen but I couldn't read it. Did someone actually ask a question or? Yeah uh, Edward. Yes yes I have to hide some of my other windows so I can actually see when this happens. From now on I think I will be able to reply. Yes, so please ask, ask the question. Oh, no problem. I just had a quick question, basically, yeah. uh, whether you're going to, when you say late times, you're really probing times on the order of the plateau, because the plateau is more than just the sort of two-point function and eigenvalue repulsion that you're seeing on the plot on the left, right? That's more I than will that. absolutely explain that, in, in, I hope, in complete detail. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so great. So the result basically is that um, boundary theories in holographic duality um, do exhibit this late time RMT behavior so that they are approximately well described at late times by random matrix theories. And that's a more general statement one can make. It's more general than just those two dimensional examples where boundary theories are exactly described at all time scales by random matrix behavior. Okay, and that's the distinction I wanted to make in this introduction. And the main technical insight that will allow us to talk about is that um, this kind of RMT behavior, the late time RMT behavior, is universal because it follows from just very simple symmetry breaking pattern and is therefore also fully uh, or very well um, controlled by the associated Goldstone effective field theory. So causal symmetry breaking is one concept I need to explain and then Using it, I want to explain an effective field theory of quantum chaos, and I want to then, of course, embed it in this uh, holographic context. And in particular, I want to point out that there is a clear sense in which uh, this kind of physics um, has a meaning in individual quantum systems rather than systems that are a priori already ensembles. Okay, so um, good. Um, I guess the last part of my introduction is to give you just a little intuitive feel of what, what this causal symmetry actually is and where it comes from. And so um, the best way that I have found so far to talk about this is by focusing on a particular observable which is ubiquitous in this business. And this observable is the two level correlation function. So I look at the spectral density, so R2 of omega is this function that I want to describe. I look at the correlation function of the spectral density at different energies. So at energy E and at energy E plus omega roughly. And I normalize it by this quantity delta. One over delta is basically the level, uh, average level spacing. But we'll what, get what does the expectation value mean there? Yeah, yeah, I was going to get there. This, um, this is actually a very important question. Um, well, if you allow me for now, let me say that it means a random matrix expectation, but I would like to discuss how uh, 
So for example, no, let me also say that, for example, in an individual system without having an ensemble, this could be an averaging, for example, over small energy windows. Um, the precise uh, averaging here, as you will see, is not that interesting if I talk about the effective field theory, but it is a very important thing to establish on an in principle basis. And I, I can make some comments on that if you want. But maybe now, because I want to try and stay at the intuitive level, it's a bit early. Is, is that okay? Yeah, well, I'll ask again later if I don't. Yeah, yeah, please, please do. Yeah. But it's, a, it's an important point that you make, and we should definitely keep it in the back of our mind. But it is true that, of course, if you don't do any kind of averaging, no averaging at all in some sense, then there can't be a correlation between two spectral densities because it's just row times row. Okay, but anyway, so now um, let's focus on one of these rows and um, let us define it as um, the discontinuity across the real axis of the um, advanced and the retarded uh, propagator. So G plus minus G minus. It's basically the imaginary part of, say, the retarded propagator up to some factors of i and pi, which I'm ignoring here. Now, the uh, insight here in some sense is that if the opposite causality propagators are equal, of course, then in the limit that epsilon goes to zero, also the spectral density will vanish just by definition. And so if you have, it turns out, a vanishing spectral density, this little observation here can be, uh, let's say, enhanced to a full causal symmetry, which means that you can actually rewrite uh, physically relevant observables, such as, for example, this R2. Um, in terms of degrees of freedom, which make reference to G plus and G minus, but that can be rotated into each other. And it turns out that this rotation, and I will show this technically again later, is turns out to be a graded symmetry. It will be some kind of GLN slash M symmetry, where what N is and M is the, depends actually on the observable that you want to calculate. For example, in this case, it will be GL2 slash 2. So, Sorry, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit confused about the, the logic here. I mean, Previously, yeah. you said you were going to say something kind of universal that held for all boundary CFTs or something like that. And now, yeah. um, but what, what is G then? What do you what mean by G? What is the a priori definition of G for a, for a general conformal field theory? You mean G plus or G minus? Yeah. Um, well, it's for example, if you take... Uh, I mean, you're not going to like precisely that because you're going to tell me there are also non-Lagrangian theories, but let's say you have your Hamiltonian. It's just, uh, let's say, the operator 1 over E minus H, with uh, E being slightly displaced into the upper half plane. 1 over E minus H. Yeah. As an operator, the inverse operator. <laughs> the resolvent will be the trace of this. Resolvent would be the trace of this, but G is without the trace. Yes, but it's related to the resolvent, yeah. Now, actually, <laughs> uh, again, Clay, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, I don't really, op I don't know operationally how to define the resolvent for a theory where I don't even know how to write down H. Yeah. Um, okay, but- Okay, um, uh, Julian. So when yeah. you say rho is zero, um, in some cases, can that ever happen? Because you always have states. It shouldn't it at least be a bunch of delta functions or something? Yeah, so rho has to be, so there can be any, can't be any cuts. So rho has to be zero except on isolated poles. That's precisely so In that case, right. you would say it does have causal symmetry? Yes, yes. It's broken only if there is an actually actually a cut. And so um, then if rho is non-zero, there cannot be such a rotation. And as we will just see, actually, this, this GLNM uh, rotation is actually broken uh, and you know, sp broken spontaneously. And the uh, theory that describes the symmetry breaking is actually the one that allows us to fix the universal part of R2. So there were already very good uh, questions and more detailed questions, and I think maybe we can try and uh, answer them as we go along. But uh, I was just trying to give you here uh, the most in, uh, sort of rough scale intuitive argument what this could be and where it's coming from. And the idea is simply to write rho of E as the discontinu discontinuity across a cut, 
Um, and if that discontinuity is zero, there is a symmetry uh, present that I will define later more precisely. And if it's non-zero, then the symmetry has to be broken. So um, now maybe this comment on time scales. I just wanted, this is just here to illustrate something about time scales. So um, again, I've showed it before, but people like this spectral form factor and there's basically two, uh, you know, this, this actually is for the example of SYK, just to be precise, but there's actually two uh, characteristic time scales that will play a very important role in what I'm going to say. One is this black dashed line which is what people like to call the Taoist time. This is really the time where this universality sets in and it is a system dependent time. This is essentially where this ramp starts. And then there is this time, which I'm calling the red dashed line, which is the, uh, what people like to call the Heisenberg time. And this is where this plateau starts, which is also universal, but you see there's two different qualitative behaviors. There's this ramp and this plateau, and then they're associated to the Taoist time and the Heisenberg time. And um, this time scale here, both of these time scales basically scale exponentially in the entropy. And it means that we, are, we need to understand the basically resolution of the spectrum at scales that are e to the minus s. And since the action, as you will see, basically goes like e to the omega, this means that we have, we have to have, well, e to the one over omega, that we have to have e to the minus e to the s type effects. Um, and so this, this effective field theory is actually particularly good when uh, we are in this regime. And it has nothing to say about the other regimes of the dynamics. So um, that was sort of the context and motivation, but um, it's probably high time that we go a little bit more into the technical details, because also there were various questions that wanted clarifications. So um, let's go and construct with this thing that I've been calling the effective field theory of, of quantum chaos. So let me take a particular point of departure, which is that, again, I'm going to focus on this, let's say, two-point correlation of rho. We could also think about higher point correlations, but the two-point correlation already illustrates what I want to illustrate. And I want to basically start with this kind of spectral determinant. So I want to consider a quantity which is essentially the ratio um, or two ratios of determinants where um, Z1 is some energy, H is the Hamiltonian of the system, Z2, Z3, Z4 are also some energies. And um, the utility of this spectral determinant is that we can use it, for example, to recover this spectral correlation function. So again, um, there is some sense to this averaging here. Um, which again, I'd like to postpone a little. But the point is that you can get this rho of E, rho of E, um, basically by taking two derivatives with respect to two of these energies. So for example, Z3 and Z4. And then you have to set energies pairwise equal, defining uh, you know, the first energy and the second energy that you're probing the spectrum at. And then there is also some customary uh, uh, normalization here. What's not just normalization is that you also need to look at the real part of this, essentially because you want twice the imaginary part here. Uh, twice the imaginary part of some quantity will give you each time the role. But um, a, a, a sort of innocuous remark that will come back to be interesting later is that actually you can swap Z1 and Z2, still taking the Z3 and Z4 derivatives and then setting energies pairwise equal, and you get the same two-level correlation function. And this is referred to as a vial symmetry and will be quite useful later um, in making some, some, some phenomena more transparent. So now what we do is we can basically trivially rewrite such a determinant, as you all know. Um, I can write it uh, as the determinant over, uh, so as, as the determinant itself, I can write it, I can, I can uh, introduce some Grassmann auxiliary fields, eta bar and eta, and I can write it as this Grassmann integral over eta bar and eta, which are now, if the Hilbert space dimension is L, then these are um, two L Grassmann numbers eta. Okay, so H is some L by L matrix. Now, of course, uh, we have determinants and inverse determinants, but in inverse determinants are even more basic. The inverse determinants are computed basically by uh, corresponding bosonic integrals. And so this ratio 
Z4 uh, that I defined of two pairs of determinants um, is given by an integral over a graded object over what I call psi and psi bar, which is now a graded object of dimension 4L, which um, induces or which, which has a natural GL 2L slash 2L action. So 2L because for each uh, determinant I had to introduce 2L Grassmann numbers and it's graded because I wanted ratios of determinants. And the number, the reason that I wanted ratios of determinants is actually essentially to take care of normalization. See, once I take a derivative here, I always spit out the determinant out front and times the quantity I want. And so then setting Z1 to Z3, for example, makes this normalization cancel. So this is actually, if you want, to those of you who are familiar with this, this is a sort of a, in my opinion, slightly slicker way of doing the same as the replica trick would do. You manage to get normalized quantities. Here you're using some graded objects. Okay. So um, now comes the important bit. And he, okay, here now we need to start uh, talking a little bit about what we mean about this average. So the idea um, that, that uh, I'm giving here is that what happens is that if you focus on the late time dynamics um, given in a chaotic system, then well, the intuition here, I must say, maybe slightly apologize, the intuition here comes from mesoscopic systems, okay? But it's in some sense, I think it's, it's, it's a nice intuition, which is that and the dominant contribution to such quantities comes from basically scattering processes which are phase coherent. So if I go from some, I want some transition amplitude from some initial to some final state, then um, typically um, paths can only contribute if there are nearby paths, which have essentially the same scattering phase shift. So for example, the green path here and the well, blue or, or, or purplish path. Um, but there wouldn't be a, a, a contribution that comes from pairs like um, green and red or purple and red. And of course I need pairs, right? Because I have pairs of observables. I have row, row. Okay, this corresponds to G plus G minus, so pairs of observables. So the dominant contribution to such uh, process is basically given by phase, by dominant contribution to such transition amplitudes is given by phase coherent processes. And what that means is that in this entire, uh, in this entire integral here, that has a GL to L to L action, the processes that are actually important at late times are ones that are singlets, meaning that they contract all the L indices and reduce this GL 2L slash 2L to a GL 2 slash 2. And so what I'm trying to say is that the action that we're left with is going to be action over 2 slash 2 graded matrix with causal symmetry. Now to make this exact, and this is where the statement comes, to make this exact in any given system, there has to be some sense of averaging. But, and this is the interesting part, what this averaging is, it doesn't have to be an integral over a random matrix or anything like that. What you need to do is you can, for example, average over some artificial parameter that you introduce. You can introduce, I don't know, for example, in mesoscopic systems, you might introduce perhaps over a random magnetic field, just one parameter. And the statement is that you can demonstrate that such mild averaging stab stabilizes exactly this effective field theory that I'm going to write down for you. But not only does it stabilize this field theory, it's also true that the actual system, the system without having averaged over a small set of parameters, still behaves like this effective field theory, except that you need to superimpose fluctuations. Okay. So the meaning for a system, if you want, and this maybe is the best answer I can give to Clay's first question, is that even in the individual system, the predictions of this effective field theory have a meaning. But the meaning is not that the system behaves exactly like that prediction. This prediction is like an envelope function and you find fluctuations around it, okay? So we, we, can, we can discuss this more, but I just wanted to have this out of the way. But to give you perhaps um, a slightly better um, idea of what the singular projection means, let us look at random matrix theory. Um, I, 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 I must say there are other examples where you, know, you can stabilize this effective field theory explicitly. 
but most of the time the calculations really are rather painful to see. And I mean, I want to emphasize the fact that there is an effective field theory that comes out. So it goes a little bit counter to this approach to, you know, torture you with many microscopic derivations. For example, SYK is a system where you can exactly derive this field theory and so on. But anyway, what happens is the following. What happens with all of these, uh, in all of these cases is that um, analogously to what happened with H, right? If you just think about integrating out H with some potential here, if you want, you can even take it to the Gaussian potential to be concrete. What happens is that um, the only contractions that can survive are when, so let's say H has indices mu nu, okay? So these are really the indices on Hilbert space. So I have some psi bar mu, H psi mu. After I've integrated out H, the only things that can be left are basically psi bar mu, psi mu, and higher powers of that. It's simple, right? Just because you've integrated out H. And this, because psi actually also has this graded structure, you can convince yourself that the res resulting um, theory has this GL2 slash 2, actually. Okay, so I've gone to singlets on the Hilbert space, and I'm actually left with a GL2 slash 2, actually. And this GL2 slash 2 action is the precise definition of this causal symmetry. Because, roughly speaking, um, it rotates the two causal sectors into each other. Okay? Each causal sector was, uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, associated with one of these pairs of determinants. Okay, so now um, the effective field theory, uh, basically you have to realize that what I remarked before, that a non-zero density of states means that G plus and G minus have to have different values. And that means that these pairs, so the two and the two have to be further broken to GL one slash one times GL one slash one. It's basically because uh, you have uh, an expectation value um, for the level density that is different in the advanced and the retarded sector. And then, okay, now we're basically in business because now what we're saying is that we have, um, we have a spontaneous symmetry breaking. We know what the symmetry is. And so we know what the coset is. And so we can go and we construct the theory. And so for this particular example, which is just one of many observables that I can compute, the Goldstone manifold is a super coset and it's the GL2 slash two divided out by GL1 slash one times GL1 slash one. Sorry, I'm confused. Yeah. Are we doing quantum yeah. field theory or are we doing matrix models? What do you mean when you say there are gold stones for a matrix model? Well, um, I mean, I mean uh, sorry, in, you mean yes, you mean for example, if I act, I mean, I can do it for both. I can also do it for the, I can also do it for random matrix theory if this is the question that interests you. Well, Maybe I'm missing something basic. Like in, in QFT, there's no symmetry breaking in two space time dimensions and below. Uh, but here we seem to be discussing some notion of symmetry breaking and Goldstone bosons for matrix models, which I've never heard of. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm just lost about that. Good. Um, actually, I, I do have a precise answer to that, including symmetry restoration. Um, but, well, let me let me just preview it for you, and then uh, you know when we get there. So the point is that um, you have sort of like um, you have a saddle point solution. So so this integral that I have here, um, this integral that I have here, uh, uh, once you've integrated out h, this just becomes like a quartic uh, a quartic theory for these fermions psi. Mm -hmm. Quartic theory for this fermions psi. And this quadric theory for the fermion psi does have an expectation value for basically psi bar psi. And this uh, psi bar psi uh, expectation value is different in, the, in one sector to the other. And it defines for you, let's say a mean field which breaks this. But then, okay, so this may, maybe is the point which addresses your question. So I can basically you know, expand this around one of the symmetry breaking points and the other symmetry breaking points and the perturbative expansion about the symmetry breaking points basically gives me the ramp. But if I want to find what happens here at very late times at the plateau, I actually have to integrate over these entire manifold and I find that the symmetry is actually restored. 
and I find that I don't actually have branch cuts, I actually have individual poles because this thing here corresponds to the individual poles. Okay, so if you want, there are different phases in time, this is in time, at which various levels of description of this theory are relevant. And at the very latest time, the full non-perturbative description is relevant, and this is when the symmetry is in fact stored. I don't know if this makes you happier. But it is true even for a matrix model. This is literally even true for a matrix model. I'm telling you that there is a Goldstone type theory even for a matrix model. And you can get most, almost all of the universal predictions of matrix models, which, which you can also get with more elementary means, but you can then get them also from this field theory. Is it fair to say that you have some large n parameter that's suppressing fluctuations of your Goldstones? Absolutely. And the large n parameter is actually the size of the Hilbert space. It's e to the s. But the, to get the physics of the plateau, sorry for all this flipping of slides, that's a bit annoying. But to get the, the physics here, you need to have the fully non-perturbative physics in e to the s. And that's when you see that actually the symmetry is restored. OK. Um, I had a much more basic question about this slide. Again, about the, the um, uh, which, which one actually? This slide here. Um, yeah. So again, about the non-zero density of states. So if I take just a trivial example of some in, you know, integrable theory, and I just, uh, so I have a kind of discrete spectrum, and then I just tune some mass gap or something, uh, and average over that. So that's going to give me, again, some you know, artificial de density of states probably, but, but you, you, you probably wouldn't want to apply your, your theory to that. Sorry, I'm not sure I completely understand. So you take, a, you take an integrable theory and you also want one which has a fully discrete spectrum? Well, uh, um, yeah, we're just some, you know, a, a gapped free scalar field, something like that. And then I tune the mass. So, so my density of states is just a bunch of delta functions. So there you would say, yeah. oh, it doesn't spontaneously break the symmetry. My, Actually, actually, I think this question that, that you ask has been really recently addressed. So for, if I understand correctly, you might, you, let's not take bosons, let's take fermions. You might ask what happens to what people like to call the quadratic SYK model, which is really just a bunch of fermions with random mass term. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, using this technology, you can get the Poisson statistics of the level spacing out, but it's a real pain. Uh, if you want, I can give you references that do that. But if you do it um, and you're not careful, uh, you might you might actually end up in, a, in a predicting that it actually has uh, has has a has level repulsion. I see. Okay. So actually, Jacques Verbarchot wrote a very long, very careful paper about how this works. Okay. Okay. So uh, moving on. So um, now. Um, Given that there is such a uh, um, effective field theory, um, which I promise, Clay, <laughs> um, you can use basically standard methods. So uh, this Callan, Coleman, Vestomino, for example, to construct it because you know you have uh, the theory, um, and uh, you have the symmetry. Excuse me, you have the coset, and you can just write down all the allowed operators. And so, just writing down, um, so you can see an example, and um, writing down the most relevant terms. Um, this is the first really example of where this ever was done by people like Yefetov and by Wigner, um, in the context of mesoscopic physics. Uh, you have the uh, you have this term here, which is actually a small explicit symmetry breaking, which we will return to in a sec. And then you have here all your higher order terms, but maybe actually, Clay, this is, this is already helpful. You see, these are only spatial gradients. These are not, there are no time derivatives here. Okay, these are just spatial gradients. Okay, so the construction, of course, is the same. Uh, you know, you write down your differential forms and so on in order to um, be sure that you, you know, not only you realize the symmetry, but you only have spatial gradients. And why do you only have spatial gradients? Because you're asking about observables where you fix two energies. You're basically freezing things. You know, you're freezing things to be only probing them at two fixed energies, and that's why you only have spatial gradients here. Okay, so it's not like your uh, box standard, uh, you know, plain vanilla Goldstone effective theory, but the symmetry principle that goes into it is the same. Now, wh what is this, what is this uh, small symmetry breaking term here? I, I was actually 
smuggling that in, I was brushing that a little bit under the carpet. The point is that when I said that the symmetry is here, it is actually broken by Z. So Z was this uh, was these four energies. I can basically arrange them into a diagonal matrix Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4. And if Z1 is different from Z2, different from Z3, and different from Z4, this the difference in energies actually um, explicitly breaks that GL2 slash 2. But the point is that it breaks it explicitly and weakly because we're interested in extremely small energy differences. Remember, this was actually one comment that I made at the beginning. We want to talk at energy differences that are order e to the minus s that are extremely small. And so this is where precisely we have as, 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 as a, a symmetry that is broken explicitly by a small amount and spontaneously by a large amount, namely the row. And that means we're basically uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the land of pions. I mean, except, of course, that there is no time to work, but okay. But it is it's very, in the symmetry sense, it is very analogous to, to, to uh, pion fields, okay? And so um, we basically now just uh, tickle out the, the, the physics of these chaotic pions, and this gives us actually all of the universal content of random matrix theory. This is a different way of looking at, even at random matrix theory, if you want to, but of course, the power of it is that it also applies to more general chaotic systems. So what you do is uh, you just uh, now introduce a field Q, um, which uh, is essentially the exponential of what we would call the pion field in QCD. Uh, sorry, I mean, T, T is given by E to the W, where, um, sorry, I can't see my own screen, let me, okay. T is given by e to the w. So I had some window in front of this, didn't I? Um, and so um, w is the matrix which connects which the, the broken generators. And so w is really the pion field. Um, and q is a different parameterization of this Goldstone manifold that is useful. So let me make some comments. So I showed you here this effective action. I said it was one example. I basically showed you what one might call a single particle version of this EFT. More relevant is a many body version, which we uh, expand upon in the paper. It's just, there's a lot more uh, paperwork that goes into it. And um, I've used this RMT to average the singlet projection, but the general quantum system, this um, is achieved by taking a late time limit plus perhaps some mild average. And I do want to again say why this mild average I think is actually um, a great, uh, shall we say, achievement. Because you see, RMT, you're really integrating over the full matrix. You have as many parameters as there are degrees of freedom in the matrix. Here, what we're saying is that the mildest of averagings, even just one parameter, or for example, what was recently done by various people, just uh, you know, average over some moduli space. This is also just a finite set of parameters, a small set of parameters, is actually enough to stabilize this EFT. And therefore, um, also is enough to ensure that the late time predictions are identical to those of the appropriate random matrix ensemble. And when I say appropriate random matrix ensemble, I mean that now we can actually go back to this famous Atlant Zinbauer classification of the 10 symmetry classes, and we basically pick out the one that is appropriate to our system. What is nice is that this classification actually uh, has its counterpart in this target space. Uh, you know, I showed you this particular coset, but basically there is 10 symmetric spaces. They're all Cartan symmetric spaces. There's 10 of them and they are in one-to-one -one correspondence uh, with the RMT ensembles. And moreover, the Weyl symmetry is exactly the Weyl, Weyl symmetry in the Lie algebra sense that is more manifest in this Cartan approach. Um, Further comment that generalizes to ratios of more spectral determinants. Let's say you want to know more spectral probes of more ratio, sorry, more products of rho. Uh, we use this graded or supersymmetry approach because I think it's the slickest way of doing it, but it is quite common also to use replicas if you're more comfortable with that. So now let me just tell you a little bit more about what is, how does this come out, this universal content of RMT. I think that's quite fun. So um, let us wait long enough so that all these gradient terms have decayed, okay? And we're left only with this leading term here, this ZQ term. And I gave it like in the EFT spirit, I gave it some, some 
undetermined coefficient. Actually, just by, comp just by comparing it to the one-point function, which determines the one-point function of G plus, for example, determines the spectral density, right? Um, you can actually fix this to be essentially up to a factor of minus i pi over two. This is rho here. I write it as one over delta. And so this is what you're left with. And this is, of course, the super trace. So because I have a graded object, it's a super trace here. So um, now let's go back to that. We actually wanted to evaluate these spectral determinants. And, and in some sense, this is now easily, easiest done in terms of these you know, so-called pions. So let me explicitly parameterize this with you know, the two complex matrices B and B tilde, which precisely are off diagonal. So they're the other ones that rotate the plus degrees into the minus degrees of freedom, which is the broken symmetry. So those are the, uh, yeah, those are the pions. Now, um, what's really fun is that there is actually more than one of one saddle point that breaks the causal symmetry breaking, always two because of this vial symmetry, because they're actually mapped to, into each other by this, by this vial symmetry. So the presence of the vial symmetry ensures that there are these two saddles. Um, the target uh, space uh, of these goldstones, there is basically hyperbolic two space times a two sphere. And these two saddle points are the same as far as the H2 is concerned, but they li lie on opposite poles of this two sphere. And in particular, in a, in a co coordinate system that people like, the North Pole is usually called the standard saddle, which has action zero. And there is a second saddle, which is named after Andreev and Al Schuller, which um, is at the South Pole. And this has an action which is proportional to E to the minus the entropy. Um, little comment, uh, small comment, this is something that to you guys ex is extremely obvious. The fact that the action of the standard saddle is zero is actually a consequence of the fact that it preserves supersymmetry. And if I have a supersymmetry preserving, I mean, you know, this graded symmetry, if I have a, a configuration that preserves this graded symmetry, then the super trace just vanishes, right? That's it. Whereas this Andreev Altschuler saddle has the uh, added feature that it breaks also some supersymmetry. So I, I recap, both break the causal symmetry, one preserves supersymmetry, one breaks it in addition. Julian, can I ask you a yeah, question? Yeah, sure, yeah. Sorry, so I'm, I'm just a little confused what this mm -hmm. S should be. So if before we just had basically a finite dimensional Hilbert space and you, you know, this, this plateau uh, sort of requires like a finite dimensional Hilbert space. And now we're sort of using like E to the S as a proxy for that. What is this entropy? And if it's somehow related to the state, where does the state come into this construction? Uh, e to the minus s is basically the average level spacing. You know, the average le the level spacing is basically uh, the, the the average distance between two levels is e to the minus s. This is how this comes in there. Because if you have, you know, um, a finite Hilbert space, then there are approximately e to the s levels, uh, and so the spacing between two levels just very roughly is e to the minus s. And that's where it comes from. You know, I'm not saying that it's equal to it, I'm just saying it's scaling like that. And the scaling comes with precisely from the, from the difference in levels. Okay? Thank you. So, um, now, comes, uh, so, so now comes something that um, I found very fun working out, which is basically this, this uh, now pion expansion of, let's say, uh, this effective field theory can actually be arranged into a topological expansion. And that topological expansion, of course, I want to uh, then finally connect to bulk physics. And so in terms of the pion fields, let's say if you want to calculate two-point correlation function of rows, we're back to calculating this Z4 and then taking derivatives. And um, at the uh, lowest level of approximation, you approximate the action in terms of the pions to quadratic order. And this will give you the leading term. You will actually have to go to higher orders for higher order terms, but let me just go to the leading order term. Um, I'm integrating over these BB tilde fields now. This is, the, this is the integral over the Goldstone manifold that I started with. I'm just expressing it now in terms of the BB tildes. And let me measure the level uh, spacing in terms of um, so omega is the typical difference in energies, and I'm measuring it in terms of delta. And for a somewhat annoying reason in the chaos literature, this is often denoted as little s, which is of order e to the capital S entropy. Sorry. 
But now the simplest diagram that contributes to this to this expectation value is basically given by well we need to we need to basically um, just write the determinants the derivative of the determinants in terms of b b tildes and it turns out you know once the dust settles it's just two super traces which uh, are of the form b b tilde times a projector on the fermionic subspace and then this one is b tilde b times a projector to the fermionic subspace and I have I hope helpfully colored one of them red and one of them blue because actually as it turns out this one is like the retarded in red and the, this is the advanced in blue and so the the non-trivial um, this is just a Gaussian so we can do it with the wick contraction um, and the diagram just turns out to be one over s squared but you can visualize it in various different ways you can you can you can have this thing that people like to call the wagon wheel so there is a projector pf in blue and here's the projector pf in red and this is just the contraction between the b and b tilde matrix um, and so it's one over s squared and maybe one one uh, uh, remark that i can make is that the fourier transform of this one over s squared is actually t linear and if you work out precisely the coefficient of this diagram get precisely the ramp with the right coefficient, which I will do in a second. I just wanted to um, give you this contribution. However, um, you also have uh, higher topologies. So once we start um, associating fat graphs and we are associating Riemann surfaces to these contractions, as is of course natural to people working in our field, the next interesting one is the one that comes from expanding to higher order and then taking the exponential of BB tilde four into the expectation value and um, i spare you the contractions here but what you find is there is a non-planar contraction here um, of course this bb tilde to the four is what gives you the two crosses here um, and this via its fat graph basically uh, um, is a genus one surface with two boundaries here and once you do the diagrams you find that it goes like one over s to the four Whereas the, where the coefficient depends on which symmetry class you're in. And in fact, the simplest symmetry class, the unitary one, this coefficient is just zero, as in fact are all higher order corrections, which is just an artifact of the unitary symmetry class and can actually be shown in some sort of localization way if one is so inclined to do. Um, interestingly, actually, th these kind of contractions here have, have in some sense appeared before in the chaos literature and people like to refer to it as this Sieber-Richter pair. Just was the comment. But the point question. is... Can yeah, I ask a question? Of uh, course. Could you, could you remind me, how did you get to the propagator, uh, one over S? How did you determine the quadratic coefficient? Yeah. Here, right? Yeah. It's just a propagator yeah. here, the Gaussian one. Yeah, but how did you determine it's S times B, B tilde? Oh, excuse me. Um, because uh, you have this thing here, super trace Q, Super Q is E to the W. Uh, um, Q was T times tau three times T inverse, and you just expand it to quadratic order, and you find you find precisely this thing here. Uh, okay. I see. Thank you. It is extremely important to get the factor two right here because these coefficients here. Once I really calculate the coefficient, this is a prediction, and it has to be the right coefficient. You will see in a second why. But I want to just tell you the, um, the full structure. The full structure is that you can now calculate this R2 in terms of you know, a perturbative expansion around the standard saddle, which is just equal to e to the zero. Then you have the genus zero with two boundaries, genus one with two boundaries, genus n with two boundaries. These are just reinterpreting the fat graphs as, as uh, interesting Riemann surfaces. And then you have the second contribution, which comes from this second saddle, which has a perturbative non-perturbative prefactor e to the 2i times little s and then it also has an expansion of this kind and the fun part is that um well let's let's just for for simplicity stay in the unitary ensemble so this cuts off here at s in squared inverse and cuts off here at s squared inverse with this prime here this is a slightly different term but you can evaluate them and you get r2 is the real part of 1 over 2s squared times 1 minus e to the minus 2 is which is precisely sine squared s over s squared, otherwise known as the sine kernel, which was derived by Freeman Dyson in the 70s. And this is fully universal, as you know, in random matrix theory. This is the 
basically the microscopic structure of level spacing in a random matrix theory. But here we, we got it out of this effective field theory. And you see the point is there is no free parameters in this. So in order to get exactly the right parameters, all these things have to be correct, like all these factors and you know, all the symmetry factors have to be taken account of. But the point is that it works. So, so here is one um, prediction of matrix theory that you get in this way. But let me again emphasize, it also comes out for a generic chaotic system uh, once maybe you've done some mild averaging. So the fact that it works for random matrix theory is maybe unfamiliar to us, but it's not very spectacular because everybody knew about it. But the fact that it works for individual chaotic systems, plus perhaps some mild averaging, is very interesting. And that's where you actually need this formalism. That's really where the power lies of this formalism. Now, um, okay, I've already given you the summary, but let me just say it one more time. So the universal part that is captured by this EFT is this Ram plateau part. It can be seen as coming from essentially um, expansion around one saddle here, perturbative expansion around, around one saddle, around the Tatalis time. Around the Heisenberg time, you have to actually take account of the fact that there is a second saddle, which is the other pole of the sphere. You have to look at the perturbative contributions also here. But to go to really late times, really late times, you actually need to do the full integral, which in the unitary symmetry class can actually then um, explicitly. And you find that the symmetry is restored. And the fact that the symmetry is restored means that there are only poles. So the level density looks like a delta function around one energy. And as you know, the Fourier transform of a delta function is a constant. And that's precisely the plateau if you want. But okay, I haven't shown you technically how to get here. I have only shown you basically this part there. So now um, what I want to say, but I guess I'm running out of time. Um, I'm just gonna say it and maybe we can uh, add some more flesh in the discussion that follows. Um, as I was trying to already hint at graphically, the terms in this topological expansion are arranged into the same topologies as the expansion of the JT matrix model, for example. And I want to propose that this is not a coincidence. Um, well, which leads me to this bulk part, but um, I think I don't have time to talk about this now. The point that I want to make is that, um, yes, so um, the universal part, meaning the most singular in energy differences, I maybe remind you that, uh, maybe, maybe I'll go back to this other thing before I flash all these things. One over S, right? One over S is basically different, tells you about differences in energy. So these terms are all singular as energies approach each other. They are singular as um, E1 goes to E2. And of course, this is the singularity that comes from the massless degrees of freedom, which are the Goldstone bosons. And what this EFT tells you is that the coefficients of all these singular terms, the coefficients, only the coefficients of the singular terms, are fixed by causal symmetry and are therefore universal predictions of if you want quantum chaotic systems. And so what we did was we went back to uh, the, these results that people have uh, presented in lower dimensional gravity, including by now in three dimensional gravity, and we've checked what these coefficients are. And these coefficients, of course, uh, agree exactly with the universal predictions as they must. It just means that people have done their algebra right. But in particular, for example, one fun context in one can do is, especially given the audience. So Emil um, computed, for example, this uh, C less than one annular partition function. And uh, via this mapping of minimal string theory to matrix models, you can associate this to our story. And you have a nice bulk uh, interpretation. And you just check. And you look only at the singular part as the two energies uh, approach each other. So you know, there, are, there are full expressions here. Um, as you well know, but we only looked at the singular parts in energy and they precisely give you this prediction, meaning that you know the two pi's and the level densities and so on have to arrange themselves exactly to get minus one over two s squared. And another thing that you can do is that in three dimensions, for example, recently Kotler and Jensen wrote down these uh, toroidal wormholes uh, and they also give you uh, contributions to something that is like this, this annular partition function here. And again, once you strip off the factors that um, you know, give you delta and the pi's and the two's and so on, you get precisely minus one over two s squared. So they all are 
um, correct um, predictions of this EFT. And so uh, this is basically, um, well, let me, let me just basically conclude. So chaos in this uh, RMT sense is ubiquitous. Uh, the reason is that its physical content follows from a universal symmetry principle, namely this idea of breaking of causal symmetry. Um, this way, you do actually get an idea of how a generic quantum chaotic systems are described by ensembles of theories, namely random matrix ensembles. Okay, but I hope to have convinced you that this is a more general feature of quantum chaotic systems if you focus on late time physics. Uh, I did not get to this, but I'm, I'm, I was told that there might be a discussion time. We can talk a little bit more about the bulk picture. So there is some preliminary understanding of how this causal symmetry breaking is realized in the bulk. But it is actually really my, uh, my goal is to have a better understanding of what is the bulk uh, dual of causal symmetry breaking. So let me tell you about those ideas in a bit. And um, it gives a meaning to these sort of bulk Euclidean wormholes and baby universes, even in theories which are not defined by ensembles. And I want to just point out that this interpretation here is not dissimilar from recent work of the Vancouver group, who basically used the idea of ETH. So it's also some statistical theory of thermalization to basically make the same point. Um, maybe this thing that we have here is more directly connected to the matrix models that have been very popular of recent. Um, okay, so then the outlook is that, of course, one would like to understand what happens, um, you know, with fluctuations. One would like to see if there are higher dimensional singular terms that can be computed by things like higher dimensional wormholes. I'm quite hopeful with this recent paper, again, by Cutler and Jensen. I haven't actually churned it through the machinery, but I think that these singular terms will come out right again. Well, they better do, because if not, I would say something is wrong there, given that they're universal predictions. Um, well, one can ask, um, is there some more direct connection to these replica wormholes? Uh, in some sense, I, it was unfortunate that we took the supersymmetry route, because it would have been more na natural to take a replica route. Uh, in this context, but it's just it's just uh, not as elegant. And then um, we have some upcoming results which basically talk about uh, what happens if you actually ask about operator correlation functions in addition to just spectral correlation functions. So literally like, you know, bona fide operators. And uh, well, we have basically nice results on the late time physics of um, operators in the ergodic limit. And this should be coming pretty soon with these two guys that I introduced to you earlier, Nayak and Vienna. But in view of the time, I think I'll, I'll thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, so let's thank Julian. And I'm going to stop the recording. Maybe we can take a short five minute break if people need to use the, take a take a break and then we'll come back for the discussion session. Thank you.